Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I had the uh, great pleasure of uh, appearing here last year in a similar format, although last year's format was, was where the questions were already decided. This time it's more of an open forum. Um, so we don't really have anything worked out. I thought I would just uh, start off by talking a little bit about evolution, what evolutionary theory is. Um, I brought with me some overheads, and uh, you may hear uh, Dr. Hoven, for example, be referred to as a creationist. Um, we also talk about creation science, which is an attempt to prove creation uh, using scientific method, uh, those sorts of things. Um, what I brought here is sort of a comparison of the two models. Scientific creation model, which says that the universe, the earth, and life on the earth were created by supernatural processes. The universe and all its contents were created simultaneously about 10,000 years ago. Biological change um, since the creation has occurred within created kinds of plants and animals. And the fossil and geologic records are the result of a worldwide catastrophe of a hydraulic nature, specifically the biblical flood. The evolution model, on the other hand, states that the universe, the earth, and life on the earth evolved by testable natural processes. Let's see if I can get that centered. Uh, number two, the universe and all its contents evolved over time. The universe is about 15 billion years old, the earth 4.5 billion, and life on earth about 4 billion. Uh, changes occurred within species and new species evolve from existing species. Uh, and number four, the fossil and geological records are the evidence for billions of years of systematic change. Well, let's talk about evolution. And let me, let me, let me see, uh, uh, it's kind of hard for me to see, it's dark here, but how many of you really know what evolution means? The definition of evolution. If you're absolutely positive, you know what it means. Let me give you my definition of evolution, and one which a lot of biologists, anthropologists, chemists, physicists, all sorts of people of a scientific nature, uh, uh, how they use the term. Uh, but I'll just, I'll just give you my definition. This is a definition I give my students in class when we sit down. Uh, evolution is specifically a change in the gene pool in a population over time. It's that simple. It's a genetic change over time. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room tonight are exact carbon copies of your parents? Anyone? Raise your hand if you're an exact carbon copy of your parents. Do you know why not? It's because from one generation to the next, and if I use this room as our population, a population is a group of organisms. Okay? If I use this audience as our population, we could, we could, we could perform a little test uh, for evolution. And we could see whether or not the genes, right, your genetic makeup, what makes you you, are the same from one generation to the next. And if they're not, according to my definition of evolution, a change in gene frequencies in a population over time, that is from one generation to the next, if the genes have changed from one generation to the next, my definition of evolution is correct. If you're not a carbon copy of your parents, that means you have different genes. In fact, everybody in this audience is a combination of the genes of their parents. All right? Your mothers and fathers got together and bore a child, either male or female, and that child has half of the genes from his or her mother and half of the genes from his or her father. It's that simple. We're combinations of our parents. Siblings work out the same way. With the exception of identical twins, even siblings aren't exact copies of each other. You know, brothers and sisters don't turn out to be exactly the same. Well, we talk about this in terms of microevolution. And, you know, I've heard Mr. Hovind say before that, you know, microevolution, I don't think he really has a problem with that because, after all, they're going to talk about changes within kinds of animals. Noah took on the ark two of each kind of animal. Two dog kind two cat kind, two uh, ungulate kind, you know, those sorts of creatures. Well, they have to explain if Noah took two of each kind on the ark, how then do we get the diversity of species that we see today? Why do we have so many different kinds of dogs? Why do we have Dobermans and Dachshunds? And I've got a chow at home, right? Different kinds of dogs. Well, that's microevolution. It's what we consider to be a change within a species. In fact, um, one of the other things that I teach my students is that 
we can see human evolution sort of in process. Let me ask you another question. Um, how many people in here were born or, or have all 32 of their human teeth? Anybody still have all 32 teeth, including all of your wisdom teeth? You, you younger folks probably don't have your wisdom teeth yet. You're only going to have 28 teeth, okay? Uh, as long as you have your adult teeth. Anybody in here had to have their wisdom teeth removed, taken out? Come on, raise your hand. Don't be shy. We can put our hands up. I had my wisdom teeth out. Why do humans have problems with third molars, wisdom teeth? Why do we have to have them removed? And what happens to you if you have problems with them and you don't have them taken out? What happens if they get impacted, infected, if they grow in crooked? You can get very sick from it. You can die from it. Well, you know, that seems like an imperfect design. We put a design flaw in the system. We're going to make an organism that has too many teeth for its mouth. In fact, it has so many teeth for its mouth that it's going to have problems with them. And if you don't have access to modern medicine, fortunately we do, we can go to the dentist, and the dentist can put braces on our teeth, or the dentist can pull some teeth. Right? I had to go to an oral surgeon. It was really nasty. I had to go in there and cut my jaw open and take out my teeth. And in fact, they severed my mandibular nerve while they did it, so I have a dead spot in my lower jaw from it. When we look at human evolution, and one of the things that I will encourage you to do tonight, I brought along some, some fossil casts of some of what I consider to be our human ancestors. Okay? And I'm going to lay them out on this table, and I encourage you all to come up and look at them. I'll ask that you be careful with them, because they're, they're kind of expensive, and uh, you know, I don't want them to get broken. But, but feel free to come up and look at them. In fact, I'll be pointing out some features tonight on some of these casts. When we look, for example, at a human ancestor, uh, a million years ago, we find that they had 32 teeth. They had tremendously large faces. One of the things that will probably come up tonight is the issue of transitional fossils. They'll say to me, Dr. Hartman, if, if, if evolution is true, then we should see change. We should see evolutionary change over time, represented in the fossils that we have. I can show it to you. I've got it on overheads. I brought in some of the skulls. How many of you people in here have actually seen a real human skull before? Skull of an early hominid, an early human. I've got some to show you tonight. If you haven't ever seen them, I encourage you to look at them. One of the things we realize is that earlier humans had smaller brains and larger faces. Larger faces had plenty of room in there for all 32 teeth. Over time, one of the changes that's occurred in humans is that our brains have gotten larger. In fact, they're tremendously large today. Human beings have the largest brain-to-body weight ratio of any animal on the planet. Not the largest brain. I mean, a blue whale has a, a, a much larger brain than humans do. But blue whales also have tremendously large bodies. They need a huge brain to control that huge body. We made room for that large brain, the expansion of our cranium, the upper part of our skull, through a reduction in the size of our face. Our faces have been getting smaller, and I'll lay out a series of fossils for you to look at. And you'll see some of the earliest ones that we have have really large faces and really small brains. Dr. Hovind may tell you that, well, that's just a glorified chimpanzee, but I will point out to you the differences between humans and chimpanzees, and I even have an ape skull that you can look at so you can see for yourself and show you why I think that this fossil that I have is more human than it is ape. Well, over time, the faces have gotten smaller, the cranium have gotten larger, the brain has gotten larger. Well, our faces are getting smaller, that's crowding our teeth. In fact, within the last uh, 100,000 years ago, we start to see humans, not just in the fossil record, but you know, I also do quite a bit of archaeology. I'm one of the guys that goes out there and, and digs up the remains of dead people. And I've seen hundreds of them. And we see in the archaeological record that this is not a unique problem to modern humans. This is ever since we became modern humans. People have been having trouble with their teeth. And it's because of this. Ordinarily, we talk about people that have problems with their teeth being uh, in trouble from an evolutionary perspective. And if you die, you're not successful. Well, we're pretty successful. 
Um, there are currently, what, six billion people on the planet today? We're one of the most prolific species on the planet. One of the other things that I'll talk about briefly is where we fit in the animal world. Brought in a little chart. This is a, a, what we call a taxonomic system, how we categorize different things in the animal world. One of the things, by the way, that I will challenge Dr. Hovind to do tonight is to give me a definition of kind. I will ask him to do that, and I hope he will be able to provide you with a definition of kind. What, what constitutes a kind? Because I can talk about species. I am a homo sapien, genus species. Homo, genus, species, sapien. Means wise human. We got to do the naming, so we got to say that we're wise humans. In fact, to the subspecies, we consider ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, really wise humans. Boy, we're at the top of the ladder, aren't we? By the way, I don't believe that we're at the top of the ladder. Okay? In the taxonomic system, we name things, we identify things based on where they fit. The kingdom, well, we're all animals, so we're in the animal kingdom. Phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Genus, homo, species, sapiens. Did you all know, I'll give you another fact to, to, to dwell upon, I know my time is almost up here, that humans and chimpanzees share 98.2% of their genetic material. That's an interesting concept. There's more relatedness, more genetic relatedness between a human and a chimpanzee than there is between an African and an Indian elephant. And yet when we look at them, we have no difficulty saying those are both elephants. When we look at a human and a chimpanzee, we have no difficulty saying one is an animal and one is a human being. Genetically, they're not that different. In fact, it's a difference in matter of chromosomes. And let me tell you right now, chimpanzees have an extra set of chromosomes. So don't let anybody tell you that complexity is dependent on how many chromosomes you have. Because dogs and plants, some plants have hundreds of chromosomes. That doesn't make them more complex than human beings, just makes them different. Won't get into a lot of other similarities. We don't have a whole lot of time to dwell on that. One of the other things I want to bring up tonight is that there are an awful lot of Christians out there, out here in the world, who don't really have a problem with evolutionary theory. In fact, you didn't see anything in my theory that says there is no God. Don't let anybody tell you that because you are an evolutionist, because you believe in evolution, you must also be an atheist. That's not correct. The Catholic Church doesn't have a problem with evolution. The Lutheran Church doesn't have a problem with evolution. The Jewish Congress doesn't have a problem with evolution. Presbyterians, Methodists, I'm married to a Southern Baptist who is also an anthropologist. She is one of the most ardent believers in God and in Jesus Christ, and she doesn't have a problem with evolution. There does not have to be a conflict. Now, some of you are rolling your eyes. In fact, the guy at the timetable is rolling his eyes at me. Where does it say in my theory that there is no God? I don't see it anywhere. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you there is or isn't. I believe that someone's faith is a very personal thing. It's not my job to convince you that I'm necessarily right. In fact, if you walked in here completely disbelieving evolution, great. I have to stop now. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hovind. Well, it's an honor to be here tonight. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. Now for the last 10 years, I've been in evangelism, and I travel around and speak on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Even my website, drdino.com, shows our great love for dinosaurs around our ministry. I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Hartman coming tonight. It is surprisingly difficult to find an opponent to debate on this topic, and I'm, I'm very much honored that he would be willing to come tonight. Um, it appears to me, after speaking on this topic for 10 years, that uh, the ones who believe in evolution generally want to stand in front of their freshman class where they have the academic and psychological advantage, and they don't want to take on somebody on a level playing field where they can answer their questions. So I'm going to share with you tonight the two different views, and I appreciate what he said, and I would have to agree with everything he gave in his two definitions of the two different uh, theories, creation and evolution, with one minor exception that uh, I would have to dis differ with him on. 
Bible teaches very clearly that God made the world in six days, and He did it about 6,000 years ago. He said up to 10,000 years ago. Well, maybe so, I don't know. But certainly the dates in the Bible add up to about 6,000. And then 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood, and a fellow named Noah built a big boat and saved all the animals on board. This is the biblical view of history. The evolutionist view says 20 billion years ago, some say 15, some say 12, the numbers vary, but a long time ago, there was a big bang. They don't know what exploded, but they think there was a big bang. And then 4.6 billion years ago, some say 4.5, the earth cooled down and formed. And this, as it cooled down, it began to rain on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive about 3 to 4 billion years ago. This is basically the evolution theory. The Bible warned us to beware about science that is falsely so called. I like science. Don't accuse me of being against science. The word science means knowledge, things that we know by observation or testing or demonstration. It is my contention that there is absolutely nothing about evolution that is scientific. And I'll give you the six different meanings of the word evolution in a minute. But five of them are purely religious. There is no scientific evidence for them at all. And we offer a quarter of a million dollars at our ministry for somebody who can give real, empirical, testable evidence for evolution. I think kids are being brainwashed. They lose their faith. One professor said he was, at 15, became a Christian, joined the Southern Baptist Church, loved Jesus, but we went to University of Alabama, where I spoke yesterday. He lost his faith. Some professor got him to doubt God's Word. Actually, 75% of kids that go from Christian homes to secular universities will end up losing their faith by the end of their freshman year. Evolution is a religion. It violates the obvious first and second laws of thermodynamics. It does not explain where matter comes from, where energy comes from, where the laws come from. It does not explain how things get better without an input of enormous amount of energy and an intelligent force to organize the energy. It's a total violation of the known laws of science. It gives time, space, and matter the same character traits that we give to God, able to create things. It, it, I'm sorry, it just evolution, uh, I think, is a, is, a, is a dud of a theory. It requires faith in all sorts of things. It requires faith that life can come from non-living matter. Nobody's ever seen that. It requires faith that an animal can produce a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen that happen. Members who no longer believe are excommunicated, just like any other religion. If a professor at the University of Little Rock stood up in front of his class and said, students, I no longer believe in evolution. I believe creation is true. There is a l good chance that he, people would try to get him fired from his position. Dean Kenyon at Stanford University, they tried to fire him. He was a 20-year tenured professor of biology. He wrote books on evolution. But as soon as he got converted and began to be became a creationist, they fired him. He sued him. They finally reinstated him as a lab assistant, which is what college seniors do only because he believed in creation. Last week I sat in the living room of Robert Gentry, who worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories in Knoxville, Tennessee. He wrote major articles for magazines like Science and Nature, published all sorts of articles in major science magazines until they discovered he was a creationist, and his funding was shut off at the spigot instantly. Call him up. Robert Gentry's got a website, halos.com, H-A-L-O-S, and he'll be glad to talk to you about it. There are case after case where people are excommunicated because they no longer hold the faith of evolution. It is a religion. Only members in good standing are considered worthy of judgment. So if you don't believe in evolution, therefore you can't be a scientist, therefore all scientists believe in evolution. They define the terms, and of course, if we're under those ground rules, of course they're going to win the war in, in that, that situation. It att evolution attempts to provide basic answers to the questions of life. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going when we die? It is a religion. It deifies nature. Gaia hypothesis and evolution, those words are always capitalized, capital E. It's a religion. Majority opinion is somehow considered proof that it happened. I hear this all the time when I do debates. It's like, well, everybody believes in evolution. Oh, well, first place, not everybody believes it. Second place, even if everybody did, that's not proof that it happened. And these professors, and I'd appreciate Dr. Hartman coming tonight, but I'll tell you, the vast majority, you told me you asked quite a few to come tonight and they wouldn't do it. We probably get a thousand to one refuse to debate as opposed to the, the few that will come debate. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity tonight. Uh, Darwin, when he was 22 years old, graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. He set sail on board the Beagle in 1831. As he sailed around, he came to the Galapagos Islands, and he noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches based upon their beak shape. Charlie concluded that probably all the finches had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> And then he concluded that this probably proves the birds and the bananas are related. 
Charlie said in his book on page 170, it is a truly wonderful fact that all plants and all animals throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Would, would I be quoting this correctly to say that he is claiming that the birds and the bananas are related? I don't want to put any words into his mouth, but that is what he's saying, isn't it? Everything is related. See, what Charlie observed is called microevolution. And the whole argument here tonight is going to be over the definition of this word evolution. The kids, I think, are being deceived by the slippery definition of that word. Microevolution says dogs produce a variety of dogs. Roses produce a variety of roses. Folks, that's a fact. It happens. The Bible said it would happen. Ten times in the first chapter, God said the plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. And I think because of the Genesis definition here, if it's able to reproduce, it's the same kind. But you asked for a definition of kind? I gave you one. I think if it's able to reproduce, a dog and a wolf are capable of reproducing. They're the same kind of animal. Now, they're classified as different species, but they are the same kind of animal. This word evolution has lots of different meanings. There's cosmic evolution. That's the Big Bang. Some people say, that's not what's in the books. Oh, I, I taught science 15 years. Trust me, it's in there, folks. The textbook says 18 to 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. This is a vital part of their theory to explain where matter comes from. And then you'd have to have chemical evolution. If the Big Bang produced hydrogen and helium, how do we get the other 92, uh, 90 elements? We see carbon decay, potassium decays to argon, uranium decays to lead. All the evidence we see is for things decaying without an enormous amount of input of energy. In stars, under intense pressure and heat, maybe higher elements can be created for a few moments. But where did the energy come from? There'd have to be a long period of chemical evolution. Then you'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen one star form. We've seen lots of them blow up, but nobody's ever seen one form. So the evidence is against this stage of evolution. Then we'd have organic evolution. That's the origin of life. Nobody's ever seen non-living material come alive. This is not part of science. It's part of what they believe in. It's a religious worldview. Textbooks teach 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. Millions of years of rains created great oceans. This is what the books say. I'm not making this up. I collect the books. I have hundreds of them. Millions of years of rains created great oceans. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> well, I guess it is. Totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. That's how slow it is. This one says, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. This is a college textbook. So basically, the evolutionists believe that the humans, the birds, the crocodiles, all had a common ancestor. Now, they're welcome to believe that. Honestly, I don't care what they believe. But I'm sick and tired of them using my tax dollars to spread this kind of propaganda in our school system when it's not science. Charlie Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless and immediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Boy, you're right about that, Charlie. There should be billions of intermediate varieties. Where are they? Even David Ropp, who's a strong believer in evolution, said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has di died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, <gasps> you're kidding. Fantasy in the textbooks? Oh, believe me, they are full of fantasy. I would like to point out, if you find a fossil in the dirt, like the fossil replicas on the table over here, all you know is it died. <laughs> you don't know, for, you know where it died at, and you know where it ended up being buried at, but that's all you know. You don't know that it had any kids, let alone different kids. You found a bone in the dirt. Oh, okay, it died. And I'd like to ask the question, why is it you think, think bones you find in the dirt can do things that animals today cannot do? Monkeys today are still having babies. Make another human. I want to watch it this time. <laughs> Apes are still having babies. Humans are still having babies. Everything's still having babies. Why don't we ever see an animal produce a different kind? Why is it it can only happen long ago and far away? Let's see it happen. It's not observed. Fossil evidence wouldn't hold up one second in a court of law. The problem is evolution doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. It has to be stuck into the brains of these un unsuspecting freshmen when they go to college. And they don't have the option because that teacher's going to give them a grade. But I'll tell you, if, if we had to go to court of law and they said, where's the evidence? Where's the, what's the best evidence that any animal has ever changed to a different kind of animal? The best evidence they have, they claim they have, is the fossil record. 
And yet there is no fossil evidence that any animal ever produced a different kind of animal. And like I said, if you find a fossil in the dirt, that's not, fossil, that's not evidence that it had any kids at all, let alone different kids. So we have cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, stellar evolution, organic evolution. Then we would have to have macroevolution. That's changing from one kind of animal to another. Nobody has ever observed that. Finally, we have microevolution. Now, the first five are religious. The last one is science. And the kids are going to be confused with the definition of the word evolution. There's a lot of varieties of dogs, and they probably had a common ancestor, and it was a dog. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but it's still a dog. And a three-year-old can tell you it's the same kind of animal. Okay, boys and girls, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> well, duh. It's the same kind of animal. Uh, what's going to happen, though, the teachers are going to give thousands of examples of microevolution. Like he mentioned, we're different than our parents, and our jaws are smaller, and the wisdom teeth don't fit. Well, that, that's, a, that's a micro change. We're still a human. He's giving examples of microevolution, and then he's going to try to make you take a giant leap of faith and logic into believing that that somehow is mystically evidence for macroevolution. And it just isn't. Macroevolution is a fantasy based on imagination. It doesn't happen. And they spend a lot of time arguing about where is the line between micro and macro. Well, I don't know exactly where the line is in some cases. I think that might be a good field of research. But that certainly doesn't mean the other ones are included. See, the other five definitions are smuggled into the textbook, writing on the coattails of examples of macroevolution. They're just smuggled in, folks. There's no evidence for them at all. I defy somebody to show me some evidence. We've got no argument with truth. Man, I love truth. I love science. But evolution has no scientific evidence to back it up. Truth comes from God. I'd like to see some evidence to back, back up evolution. We welcome any challenge. I have a standing offer. We offer a quarter million dollars for proof for evolution. I mean, come on, let's have it. And I, I, I pay for my tickets to fly to do these debates. It's so hard to find an opponent. I, honestly, I don't, I'm not a professional debater. I've never had a class on debate in my life. And usually the evolutionists are a lot smarter than I am, but I'm right and they're wrong. It's very easy to win a debate like that. We only object to lies being included in with the textbooks. If there's some real evidence for evolution, I would like to see it. There is none. In t advertising, what's called, it's called bait and switch. It happened tonight already. Uh, Dr. Hartman gave his definition of evolution. Look at this textbook. Evolution is change over time. Is that really what they mean? In other words, there is no doubt living things have changed over time. Well, I agree with that definition. This textbook says evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. Okay, if that's really what you mean, I agree. Evolution happened. But that is not really what they mean. They, soak, they, they suck the kids into believing in evolution with this one definition, change over time, which everybody's going to agree with. You're different than your parents, aren't you? Of course you are. And then as the kids get indoctrinated, they slip in the other cosmic evolution, Big Bang, organic evolution. And they're told, if you don't believe in all this other five, then you don't understand science. <laughs> I resent that. I was in a debate in El Paso, Texas a few weeks ago, and the professor basically said over and over throughout the debate, well, you know, the average person just doesn't understand the complexities of this topic. I said, folks, what he's trying to say is, he's smart and you are dumb. That's what he's very much trying to, not to avoid saying, but that's what he means. There is no evidence. See, variations happen, but they have limits. I agree variations happen. You might get a big pig or a little pig, but you're still going to get a pig, and there's a limit. You're never going to get one as big as Texas. There's a limit. Roaches become resistant to pesticides, but they'll never become resistant to a sledgehammer. There's a limit. And it's still a roach, by the way. They don't produce any new kind of plant or animal. Variations happen. Christ Christians and creationists have no argument with that, but they have limits. Big dogs and little dogs are still a dog, and nothing new is added to the gene pool. Thank you. Form where he can go through slides, you know, zip, 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 here you go, I'm right. Everybody goes, yes, we're all good Christians, we, we, we accept that. Um, I would ask him to, to accept one of those debates where he can put his, his thoughts in words, where everybody can see them, give his evidence, put it up there, let people scrutinize it, give people a chance to respond to it in writing, give people time to think about it. That's what I would like to see. I came here tonight not because I think you all are dumb. I don't. If I did that, I wouldn't be here. I don't think my students are dumb. I'm not trying to indoctrinate my freshman class. It may surprise a lot of you to know that, you know, I carry one of these around with me a lot. Bible. 
I tell my students to read the Bible, especially if you're going to go talk about evolution and you're going to talk about creationism. You need to know what's in here, folks. The same way I would tell you that if you read nothing but the Bible, you're being misled too. You need to read what's in the science textbooks. Not just listen to what one man comes here and tells you. Read what it says in the science books. One thing I will take issue with, when you put up a quote from somebody and you see those little dot, dot, dots in them like you saw in the Darwin quote, there's something missing there. That means you're paraphrasing. You're, you're quoting something, but you're only quoting the parts of something you want somebody to see, and you're leaving out the parts that you don't think somebody should see. That's a little misleading. If you're going to put a quote up by somebody, if you're going to quote somebody, quote the whole thing. Read the whole thing. I understand time constraints, but you know, I'm not up here quoting anybody. I'm not up here telling you what somebody else says. I'm up here telling you what I have to say. Okay? Let's see, what else? I wrote quite a few notes. Um, interesting that when I said that creationists believe the earth is 10,000 years old, Mr. Hovind said 6,000 is what it says in the Bible. Um, somebody correct me, because I'm, I'm kind of rusty on this, but Adam was created on the sixth day. Is that correct? Well, in Paul, he says a day unto God is like a thousand years unto us. So on the sixth day, the earth was already 6,000 years old. If you add 6,000 years to that, which is the time since Adam, that makes the earth at least 12,000 years old, not 6,000 years old. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm nitpicking, I'm splitting hairs, but you know, if you're going to stand up there and tell somebody the earth is 6,000 years old and here's my evidence, and it's scientific evidence, or whatever kind of evidence you're going to provide, I have to be able to go and refute it. That's what science is all about. If I put up something here that you don't agree with, feel free to go after it, attack it viciously. Evolution is not a religion, it's a theory. It's no worse than the theory of gravity. I've got a set of keys here. Anybody want to take a $250,000 bet that if I let go of these keys, they will not hit the floor? Put your faith in the theory of gravity. Well, not faith, but trust in the theory of gravity. You know, Einstein was right about it. Lots of other scientists have been right about it. If you reject evolutionary theory, you're not just rejecting what he would consider somebody's religion. You have to throw out geology, physics, chemistry, archaeology, anthropology, biology, all of those ologies, all of the sciences, all of the things, by the way, we benefit from. You know, modern medicine is based on biology, it's based on evolutionary theory. Our ability to treat viruses is based on our ability to cope with their evolution. One of the reasons why the HIV virus is so difficult to treat is because it, because it mutates so rapidly. It changes. Let's see, what else? Capable of reproducing. His definition of kind. Able, two organisms able to reproduce. Definition of species, the scientific definition of species, are two organisms that mate naturally and produce fertile offspring kind of left out the fertile part, right? You could take a horse and a horse, and what are you going to get? Somebody tell me. Horse, horse kind. Take a, a, a donkey and a donkey, and what are you going to get? Donkey. Take a horse and a donkey, and what do you get? Mule. Take a mule and a mule, and what do you get? Nothing. What happened? Wait a minute, they should be able to reproduce after their kind. If they're all the same kind of animal, you should be able to get a mule and a mule together and produce more mule. You can't do it that way, folks. You have to start out with a horse and a donkey. Maybe they're the same kinds. If they're the same kinds, they should be able to reproduce after their kind. And their kind should be able to reproduce after their kind. But they can't. There's a problem there. Oh, the fan's blowing my notes. Thank you. Yeah, I've tripped over that a couple of times. You have to be careful of the podium up here. We don't see stars form. Well, you know, I've seen some images from the Hubble telescope that look pretty impressive. Star formation. You should check out NASA's website. They have some pretty amazing photographs, not just of star destruction, but of star formation. Public schools don't like the idea of evolution being taught in public schools. Well, you know, that's a matter of, of uh, personal opinion also. And you talk about not letting the majority rule, that's the whole basis of this country. We're getting ready to elect a new president. How are we going to do that? One small minority says, I'm right, oops, excuse me, 
and you're wrong, therefore I get to pick the president. Is that how we do it? Majority of scientists don't uh, uh, just sit around and say, oh, we all agree on this, so you all are wrong, and we're right, and we win. Doesn't work that way. Carl Sagan once said, um, you know, we're for science because it's been tested repeatedly and it works. If we found an alternative, you know, we're not out there trying to trick you. I'm not an agent of Satan. Somebody might argue otherwise, right? I'm trying to trick you into uh, believing there's no God or, or something like that. I'm trying to show you how the natural world works, at least how we understand it to operate. You know, at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, we don't just teach evolution. We do teach it. We teach it in the biology classes. I teach it in anthropology classes. We also have a religious studies program. To know that's a public university, and we teach classes on religion, and we study religions. Amazing. Your tax dollars are paying for people to go and study religion. How can that be if we're all against religion? It can't be. I don't have a problem with elementary schools offering classes in religious studies. But it should be more than one religion that is studied. It should be more than just the Christian religion or one particular aspect. After all, if you all are, are Baptists, you don't want your kids to go to school and learn how to be good Catholics. Do you? I grew up a Catholic. Maybe I don't want my kids going to school learning how to be good Baptists. There are differences within Christianity. How many of you want your kids to go to school and learn how to be Seventh-day Adventists? who don't quite believe the same way that other Christians do, or Mormons. See, whose version of creation should you teach? Just the one in the King James Version of the Bible? I grew up Catholic. I don't use the King James Version of the Bible. I guess I'm wrong for that. I guess I'm going to hell for that. I don't believe that. The Pope doesn't believe that. I have a very good friend of mine. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. He thinks the Pope is the Antichrist. The nice Pope, Pope John Paul II. I don't know. Well, let me give you, uh, uh, let's see, how much time do I have left? About six minutes? Okay, plenty of time. We do observe microevolution. We can observe it. Just because macroevolution, we say, well, it takes longer time than we have to sit and observe it. We talk about empirical evidence. Well, I want to talk about Mr. Hoven, or Dr. Hoven's challenge, too, by the way. Um, empirical evidence. Well, I'm sorry if it takes, you know, 100,000 years for something to change. I'm not going to live that long. In fact, unfortunately, we haven't been writing about things that long in order for us to actually have these kinds of observations. Now, give us 100,000 years. Come back then and, and check in, and I'm sure we'll have some good evidence for you. Can't do anything about that, folks. We can look at microevolution, and we can, we can, we can decide that microevolution is simply a matter of accumulated change over time, and eventually it produces what we consider macroevolution. Let me show you something. How do you suppose it got to be, if horses and donkeys are the same kind of animal, that something got screwed up with their genes so that they can no longer produce after their own kind? How did that happen? Well, I think it's because the populations got isolated. Suppose there was a primitive horse kind. Let's not even talk about species. Okay? Microevolution says that there will be change over time. Macroevolution is just an accumulation of those changes such that you get something that can no longer reproduce with what it once was. It's that simple. Here's a little diagram. Two deems of a single species, two populations of a single species, if you will. Separated by some kind of barrier, a water barrier. If you have organisms that can't cross a river and a river flows between them, it effectively isolates the two groups of populations. Put the horses on one side, the donkeys on the other, if you want to. Over time, microevolution happens to both of them. If we're willing to grant that microevolution can change somebody's teeth, why not somebody else's reproductive system? See, we can say that, well, it works on teeth, but it doesn't work on anything else. It works on everything, folks. Microevolution works on everything. Eventually, you've got enough change to where maybe their genes don't quite match up. The problem with humans and chimpanzees is that chimps have 48 chromosomes and humans have 46. 
If you did try to get a human and a chimpanzee to mate, God forbid, right? You couldn't produce anything because they have incompatible chromosomes. When the sperm and the egg get together, there's a chromosome left over, and it happens to be a big one. It's an insurmountable challenge. It won't happen. Can't even do it in the laboratory. Not that we should try. Hopefully nobody's trying that. Okay? Two separate populations separate for long enough. Different microevolutionary changes. All of a sudden, you get them back together, right? Somebody gets a farm and gets a horse and a donkey, puts them back together, and they can't produce after their own kind anymore because there's been a real genetic change, a microevolutionary change that's accumulated over time such that now it's a macroevolutionary change. Horses and donkeys and mules are different species, and I would argue they're also different kinds of animals. Let me finish up with a challenge. I saw this, you know. Hey, I'm like the rest of you. My mouth water. $250,000. Where's the criteria? Where does it say what kind of evidence I will accept? Well, one man tried to accept the challenge. Um, I'll ask Mr. Hovind if he's familiar with uh, Kevin Henke and Dr. Berend Vlarderingerbrook, who's from a Scandinavian country. Pardon me for butchering his name. One of them said that the only evidence he was told would be accepted was for him to actually create a new universe. Well, that would prove both theories, wouldn't it? Because Kevin would be the creator. He created a whole new universe. I can't do that. Nobody could do that. What other kinds of evidence? So I asked Mr. Hovind to present, you know, what criteria he would accept for real scientific evidence, real empirical evidence of evolution. Give me a suite of things to choose from. Don't just give me one thing. Also, I, I checked out his website. You should check it out, by the way, www.drdino.com. I believe that's it. Because he goes into this. There's a panel of judges who will review the evidence. But see, they're real busy men, and they don't have time to answer facetious or silly questions, so he's not going to tell you who they are. Well, you know, if I have to take my time out of my life, however long it takes me, to get my evidence together and present it, I'd like to know who's going to review it. When I submit an article for publication in a scientific journal, I get a list of reviewers. I know who's reviewing my work. Sometimes I'll get comments back from them. I know ahead of time. Now, I trust that uh, Dr. Hovind here is an honorable man and wouldn't stack the deck against me. You know, I'd like to know who the six people are, or however many judges there are, uh, who they are and what their backgrounds are, whether or not they're creationists, whether or not they're evolutionists, you know, those kinds of things. You know, um, I was being facetious, but you know, I really will make that bet with anybody. It's the same kind of bet. I'll hold up my keys and I'll let go of them. If they don't hit the floor, you win my next uh, year's paycheck. Not quite $250,000, unfortunately, but you know, not an insignificant amount of money. If you're going to reject the theory of evolution, why not reject all scientific theories? They all must just be based on religion. After all, we can't see gravity, can we? It's about time for me to stop, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. All right, this will be the uh, rebuttal session, and then we'll go into the question answer session, so it'll be exciting. Um, he mentioned that my quotes have the dot, dot, dot in there. That is very common. I mean, if you quoted the entire quote, it'd be, it'd be uh, horrendously long. And I challenge you to show me where any of my quotes in my seminar, and I use thousands of them, show me where they're not giving the true meaning of what the author said. You leave out extraneous words, that's common practice, and anybody who's quoting from, from uh, that, that, that would be ridiculous to say this is evidence. It, it seemed to be implying that I'm trying to misquote them, and evolutionists often accuse creationists of misquoting. Everything's documented right on the bottom of the screen. Look it up, show me where I'm wrong, where I'm not giving the true meaning. You mentioned about email debate, people wanting to debate me on email. I type about 12 words a minute with 18 mistakes. I get over 400 emails a day. I don't have time to get involved in a long email debate. I was home for 12 hours this week. I got in at three last night. I speak 700 times a year. I tell all the evolution, what they want to do is they want to eat up all of my time so I can't get out and speak to folks that really want to hear. They don't want to hear anyway. As far as not giving out the names of the judges, some uh, anonymous coward named Boudica emailed me and I said I shouldn't have answered him the first time because I always ignore anonymous mail. But he was, this was anonymous, and I saw emailed back and said, if you'll tell me your name, I'll be glad to answer all of your questions. He had 300 questions. 
He said, no, I refuse to give you my name. I said, well, then I'm sorry, I won't answer your questions. I don't, I've got nothing to hide. You've got my name, address, and phone number, and I'll give you a map to my house if you want. I have nothing to hide. See, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Well, Boudicca sent in what he said was evidence for evolution. It was ridiculous, but I sent it to the judges. I told him, I'm going to send it to these guys. Boudicca right away wrote nasty, vile, filthy letters full of profanity to these judges. And I said, fellas, hey, I'm sorry. I won't let this happen again. Uh, if somebody sends in some real evidence, well, here's what happens. I get probably five or six emails a week from someone saying what Dr. Hartman said a few minutes ago. Well, if I knew who the judges were, what they're trying to say is, I don't really want to give you my evidence because I don't have any, but boy, I'm going to pick on you for your offer. They, pick it, they strain at gnats in the offer of quarter million dollars rather than just send the evidence. I would like you tonight, Dr. Hartman, to give the audience here the best evidence you have for evolution, for macroevolution, the best evidence you've got. Let's not waste time with all the little stuff. Please give us the best. I have over 500,000 videos out there in circulation that we've produced, plus who knows how many copies of those that have gone around. My words are easy to examine. I don't have time to type everything out, though we are putting, as of today or tomorrow, should be my entire seminar will be on my website. You can click a button and watch the videos and listen to the audio, free of charge, and then you can challenge anything I'm saying. And if you think I'm misquoting somebody, please let me know. I'm certainly not perfect, and I've made lots of changes through the years. He mentioned evolution is a theory like gravity. Now, that is absolutely ridiculous comparison. Gravity has evidence. We can observe it happening. We don't observe anything about what he said about evolution. To compare evolution with gravity is, is silly. There's, I, well, sure, we can watch things happen. We can watch gravity. There's testable evidence. Where is the testable evidence for macroevolution? Where is the testable evidence for cosmic evolution? Where is the testable evidence for organic evolution? There is none, and that's what my offer is all about. So don't compare evolution to gravity. And then he said, we, you know, we should, if, we, if we reject evolution, we have to reject science. Well, that's a ridiculous comparison. I don't reject science. I defy you to show me one beneficial thing we have in the world today because of the evolution theory. What good has it done? Is that why we have electricity? Is that why we have computers or video projectors? Is that why we have, can you name anything we have in the advancement of science because of the evolution theory? When you, when you have your time in just a minute. Um, as far as mutations of viruses, modern medicine, all of the branches of modern science were started by creationists. The evolution came in like a leech and took over what they'd already created. They don't ever create anything new. They take over universities that were started by Christians and creationists, like 97% of the first colleges in America were started by Bible-believing Christians. They come in there and take them over, but they don't start their own. It's like a leech. They've got to take over what somebody else does. What good has evolution done? You mentioned about star formation. I believe I got your quote. You said it may be happening now. You saw some pictures of the Hubble telescope sending back. This is typical. They say, well, evolution, you know, we, we have evidence coming in right now. Or the, they're studying this in the laboratory. Why, we've been studying it for 120 years. Where's the evidence that has stood the test of time? Why is it always, well, we're looking at it right now. Well, that's not evidence yet. Let's see something that has stood the test of time. Nobody has proven the formation of any stars. They're seeing a bright spot in Crab Nebula, saying, wow, it might be a star forming. Well, it might be the dust is clearing, and you're seeing a star that was behind it all along. We don't know yet. Let's see some evidence that stood the test of time. He's mentioned about majority rule. Well, 91% of the population of America believes God created the world. 47% of them believe He did it in the last 10,000 years. If we're really going to have majority rule, then let's throw evolution out, since so few people believe it anyway. He mentioned about 98% DNA similarity. Now, this is interesting. Since only 1% of the DNA has even been studied and analyzed and decoded, it's a little premature to say it's 98% similar. If it is 98% similar, 98.2, I believe you said, to humans and chimpanzee DNA, that would prove we have a common designer. It doesn't prove we have a common ancestor. The same God designed the animals. That's what it proves. I think it was pretty smart for God to make all of the plants and animals from the same basic amino acids so that a brown cow can eat the green grass and digest it and turn it into white milk, which turned it into yellow butter, and I eat it and get blonde hair, all made from the same amino acids. That's not proof that we came from a common ancestor. It's proof the designer was thinking. See, if we didn't all have the same similarities, we could only eat each other. We wouldn't be able to digest anything else. So it was smart for God to make things from the same building block. The argument that similar DNA proves a common ancestor is like saying, I have two books on the table, and I've analyzed all the words in these two books, and I noticed they have exactly the same 26 letters. They would, wouldn't they? 
This proves they both evolved from an explosion in a print shop 10 billion years ago. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous, okay? This proves somebody's using the same 26 letters with intelligent design behind it to create words and paragraphs and sentences. An intelligent designer took the 20 amino acids and put them in to make uh, protein strands, which makes the cells, which makes our complex bodies, that were all come from the same designer. And it wouldn't hold up two seconds in a court of law to say, similar DNA proves evolution. <laughs> Any freshman law student would say, no, this could just as easily prove a common creator. And the kids ought to be taught both. He mentioned Catholics and Lutherans believe in evolution. Well, that's, those are the ones that haven't been to my seminar. If they would come, we would straighten them out. <clears throat> he mentioned about empirical evidence, and his, his answer was, I said, where's the empirical evidence? He says, well, we don't live long enough. Now, now think about that. If we could see it for 100,000 years, come back in 100,000 years, you might see the evidence. What that is really saying is, we can't show it to you. Is that what it, is that what it, okay. Therefore, that's my point. It's not science. It's not observable. It's something you believe in, and you're welcome to believe in that, Dr. Hartman, but don't call that science, and for heaven's sake, quit using tax dollars to teach that religion to the students. I'll tell you what. If we come back in 100,000 years and see that things really have evolved, then we'll, we'll start teaching it. Until then, it does not belong in education. What he translated that his sentence was, we don't have the evidence. My offer's on my website. As far as creating a new universe, I never said that to those guys from South Africa with the weird names that wrote me the letters. I corresponded with them a half a dozen times. They never would send any evidence. They did the same thing they always do. Well, who's on the panel? You know, where's the bank? What, 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 what's the account number for the bank and all this stuff? I said, look, my word is good. You send the evidence. They never do send the evidence. All they do, I was in a debate one time in, in Minnesota, and this lady said, there's lots of evidence for evolution. I said, let's see it. She said, well, there, there's, just, there's just lots of it. I said, okay, let's see it. Well, there's just, there's just so much. Okay, show me one. Oh, there's just, there's just lots of it. Okay, show me one. They never do show you one, folks. All they do is say there's lots of it. And these guys claim that they want to pick on my offer over some little straining at a gnat, and they're swallowing the camel of believing that we all came from a rock over 4.6 billion years. Man, that's ridiculous. My offer is good. The, my, my point is evolution has six different meanings. I would like empirical evidence for all six. There is none. Uh, my offer is clearly spelled out on my website, drdiner.com. Look it up. He asked, are the, are the judges all creationists? First place, I don't know. Second place, I wonder why that question would even come up. Because does that determine whether a person is qualified to be a scientist or not? In the minds of some, it certainly does. In other words, if you believe in creation, you're not a scientist. This sounds like the Soviet Union 10 years ago. If a teacher stood up in the Soviet Union and said, you know, kids, I don't think communism works. I think capitalism is a better system. What would happen to that teacher? He'd be out shoveling snow in Siberia, right? And then the leaders get up and say, hey, everybody believes in communism. Well, of course they do. Look what happens if you don't. Evolution, the textbooks are, are, are full of lies that are shown to the kids to try to get them to believe in evolution. And I resent that. You have our varieties of corn, and they probably had a common ancestor, and it was a corn of some kind. And there's all sorts of kinds of corn today, but you still crossbreed them and you still get corn. You never get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk. Nothing changes. There's varieties of dogs, and they probably had a common ancestor. You have big horses and little horses, and they might have had a common ancestor. And as far as the horse and the zebra and the mule not being able to breed, well, what, we, what we're seeing is branches on a tree that came from a common root, and now they're so different, they can no longer interbreed. That still doesn't prove they didn't have a common ancestor. Think about the argument. He's saying a horse and a donkey or a mule or jackass or whatever it was he mentioned cannot breed and produce fertile offspring. And therefore, they're different species. Well, maybe so. If, if we, if it depends on your definition of species. Who gets to, who gets to decide what the defini definition of species is, for one thing? But get a horse and a zebra and put a five-year-old next to him and say, are these the same kind of animal? Oh, yeah. Anybody could tell you they're the same kind of animal. Seeing the branches on the tree where they now have diversified, where they're no longer interfertile, well, that doesn't prove they didn't have a common ancestor. It also certainly doesn't prove the horse and the banana are related to a rock 4.6 billion years ago. We got varieties of cows and things happen, but the textbooks contain things that just aren't true. I've got a whole two and a half hour video going through lies in the textbooks that kids are exposed to to try to get them to swallow this evolution theory. And it's really sad. They're going to tell the kids the appendix is vestigial. 
Well, I'm sorry, the appendix is part of the immune system. It is not vestigial. Take that out of the book, okay? There's no such thing as a vestigial structure. This book tells the kids that the whale used to walk around. It says the whale has a vestigial pelvis and leg bones. Vestigial pelvis and leg bones, evolution of its, uh, evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling ancestors. Well, the guy that wrote this is either ignorant of his whale anatomy or he's a liar because th those bones are essential for the whales to reproduce. Muscles attached to those bones. The male and female whale bones are very different. That has nothing to do with the whale walking on land, but this kind of stuff is presented to the kids as evidence for the evolution theory. And I'm sorry, it's a lie. If you have some real evidence, I would like to see it. But don't lie to the kids. This one says, the humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I had a guy tell me that in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama. He said, humans, we got, we got proof for evolution. You no longer need your tailbone. I said, sir, there are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some very valuable functions. <laughs> but if you think the tailbone is vestigial, sir, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. It is not vestigial. I would like to point out there are no vestigial structures, and secondly, even if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. Show me how we gain something. And even people like Pierre Gross, who believes in evolution, said mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. All you get is a mutant variety. And then the textbooks tell the kids that natural selection goes in with evolution somehow. Oh, come on. I got nothing against natural selection. Natural selection is a conservative process that keeps the species strong. It doesn't change it to something else. It's sort of like a quality control. It's not going to change it to anything else. But the textbook tells the kids, natural selection causes evolution. And that just simply is not true. Natural selection keeps birds, birds, and dogs, dogs. It doesn't turn a bird to a dog or anything in between. It's a conservative process. They tell the kids the fruit fly is evidence for evolution. All they did after years of mutating those poor flies is got flies that were worse off than Grandpa Fly. They got flies with curled wings and flies with no wings. That's not a fly, that's a crawl. They got all kinds of mutated flies. They never got a beneficial mutation. They're going to tell the kids, it's still in your textbooks right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, that the peppered moth is evidence for evolution. After 40 years of watching, exactly two moths were found on the trees. Two in 40 years. So they glued dead moths to the trees in order to take the picture to put in the textbooks to make the kids believe in evolution. That's a lie, folks. They're going to tell them there's evidence from similar structure. The forelimb of the animals is all similar. That proves a common ancestor. No, no, no. That proves a common designer. Chevy and Ford all have four wheels on the ground. That proves they all evolved from a skateboard 18 million years ago. No, it proves it's a good design and it works good, okay? That's what it proved. They're going to tell the kids that human embryo has gill slits. That was proven wrong 125 years ago, but it's still in textbooks today. Ernst Haeckel made up this whole thing in 1869. His charts are used right now today at the University of West Florida. And I guarantee that same concept is being taught right now in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it was proven wrong in 1874. If you have some evidence for evolution, I want to see it, but don't lie to the kids. Uh, should, we teach that the earth, should we teach that the earth is flat in geography class, since the Bible describes it as such in many passages? See Revelation 7-1, Psalm 24-2, 104.5, Isaiah 24.18, Matthew 4.8, 1 Peter 1.20, others. Uh, obviously, I don't think we should. If, the earth, if it says the earth is flat in the Bible, the earth is obviously not flat. That's been proven. We can't teach that in geography class. Uh, I don't need three minutes to answer that question. Okay. Oh, there we go. I didn't get time to boot up the verse, um, but the Bible teaches very clearly the earth is round. It says, yes, in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40, that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. Here it is right here. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. Uh, it says, the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. The Hebrew word there is the word for sphere, a ball, a three-dimensional object. So the Bible does not teach the earth is flat. A few heathen a few hundred years ago started teaching it was flat, and they tried to blame that on the Christians. Uh, I'm sorry, the earth is round. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. I guess I get to ask a question first. Um, please state the second law of thermodynamics. And within a closed system, 
the change will always, entropy will increase. This uh, second law of thermodynamics is interesting. Um, the second law is it's stated many different ways, okay? And no matter how you state it, somebody else is going to find a different definition someplace else. So uh, basically, it boils down to the idea that everything tends toward disorder. The evolutionist somehow has got it into his mind that if you add energy, you can overcome the second law of thermodynamics. Now, this is, this is certainly not true. Adding energy does not help anything. You have to have something to utilize that energy. The sun adds lots of energy to the earth every day. All of it is destructive. Unless there's a system to utilize that energy called chlorophyll, which is a very complex molecule. If it weren't for chlorophyll, the sunlight is eventually going to peel the paint off your car and destroy the roof of your house, and when it's done, it's going to destroy the rest of the house. Sun adding energy doesn't help. The pouring your, filling your front seat of your car full of gasoline isn't going to make it run faster. You have to have a complex system to utilize that gasoline called a carburetor and a drivetrain. So the, the normal response to the second law of thermodynamics from the evolutionist is, well, in a closed system, you know, if, if you add in the first place, the universe is a closed system, okay? Where's this extra energy coming from? Secondly, I'd like to point out, adding energy doesn't help. We added lots of energy to Iraq a few years ago. We didn't organize a thing. Adding energy disorganizes things. The idea of a human embryo developing from two cells into a full-grown human, they'll say that's an example of the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics. No, it's not. It's following a complex DNA code, and there's an enormous amount of input of intelligent energy. You need not only energy, you need intelligence, and you need a system to utilize the energy. The second law of thermodynamics is one of the main proofs that evolution didn't and can't and won't ever happen. Thank you. Um, can I see the card? Thanks. Second law of thermal within a closed system change in energy will always increase. Why? Um, I guess I guess I don't I don't really understand that. You have to have uh, an intelligent designer to I guess to overcome the second law of thermodynamics. I, I I don't I'm not really I don't really grasp the answer. And I guess uh, uh, I'll have to wait for clarification on it. Um, Things tend toward entropy, but you add energy to the system. Um, you know, I'm not a physicist, but I don't know. In two minutes, I don't know how I would discuss this one. So I guess <laughs> it depends on whether or not you consider the universe to be a closed system. And he said that it certainly is a closed system. Well, I don't see any evidence for that. Um, so I guess I'd have to ask for, for that kind of thing. Also, uh, it sort of fits in with uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier about how things tend toward disorder. Things are constantly losing, like we're losing uh, 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 our appendix or we're losing our tailbone or something like that. We've never gained anything. We have gained things. We've gained uh, larger brains. I mean, evolution is not just about losing things. Uh, you don't have to necessarily lose something or have something tend toward disorder to have it count as evolution. Um, anyway, that's, that's that question. Okay, I was given. Okay, I guess we're switching back and forth. Uh, this is kind of a long one, but I'm just taking them. I am a junior at UALR, which is the university I teach at. You said earlier that you were not trying to indoctrinate freshmen. My freshman year at UALR, I studied biology under Dr. Lanza, an evolutionary biologist. Half of the semester was spent studying evolution. On the first test, I answered her questions thoroughly including quotes from various stories that I had read, but she gave me an F. The only way I was able to pass was by quoting her on the textbook. I was under the impression that college was supposed to be about teaching people how to think for themselves intelligently. If this is not indoctrination of you and your colleagues' theories, what is it? Well, I can't speak for Dr. Lanza. Um, I guess uh, the way this usually works in university is if you're asked a question and you have to provide you know, the, the answer. And if you don't agree with the answer, you know, I, I'll tell you a story I had in graduate school one time. A, a professor asked me to talk about uh, Neanderthal evolution. And I went up to her and I said, you know, I, I don't like the way the question is worded. And she said, well, I'll tell you what. You answer the question the way you want to, but if you can provide me with evidence to back it up, you know, I'll accept your answer. So I did. I changed the, the, the question slightly. I answered it. I provided her with evidence to back up what I had to say. She gave me an A on it. I think it depends on the professor. I can't speak for Dr. Lanza. 
I certainly don't think that I'm indoctrinating my students and telling them that if you don't believe the way I believe, you're going to get an F. And I don't think that's what Dr. Lanza says either. Um, I know her. I don't know her very well. She may even be here tonight. I mean, the, the flyers were circulated um, in the biology department, certainly. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know how this really relates to me, per se. Uh, I, don't, I don't do that sort of thing. Certainly, I've flunked students before. Usually, the ones that don't come to class or they don't do the assignments, don't turn them in on time. You know, uh, I tell my students all the time, if you want to get an A in college, show up for class, do all your assignments on time. Um, you know, you don't have to agree with what I, agree, what I have to say. In fact, uh, uh, when I talk about evolution in my introductory physical anthropology classes, I say, look, you don't have to agree with what I'm saying. You have to learn it. I ask that you understand it. And that, I think, is the, the key to this whole question. If she is basically saying that, you know, I don't want to learn this stuff. In fact, I'm not going to answer what she wants me, me to answer. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with Dr. Lanza demanding that she agree with her. This has to do with Dr. Lanza asking that she understand it and be able to tell, you know, tell me that you understand it. And that's the whole nature of the testing system. I don't care if you believe it or not, as long as you're able to tell me what it's all about. That's kind of what we're doing here tonight. You know, uh, you may or may not go out of here believing it, but you know, you're going to know something about it. And if you didn't know something about it before, you do now. And I tell my students the same thing about creationism. If you didn't know a lot about it before tonight, you're going to know something about it when you leave here. Oh, here's the question. Yes, sir. I would say that's an excellent answer, and I wish all teachers did what you do. Uh, believe me, there are some teachers in the universities that will fail a student if they don't, uh, if they don't believe what they want them to believe. It's not just understanding it. And I, I appreciate Dr. Hartman's answer. I would agree with him. Um, there are some, though, that don't, don't fall into that category. I think, I encourage students, if you're going to go to a secular university and the teacher asks a question like, how old is the earth? And you know the answer they want, because you read your book and you did your homework, but you don't believe it. All you need to do is write on the test. The textbook says, blah, 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 blah. However, this is not correct. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Uh, this question was asked, uh, four pages of prepared questions, obviously somebody uh, <coughs> thought ahead about this one. Are there contradictions, or why are there three creation myths in the Old Testament? Just the phrasing of the question, why are there three creation myths, shows a little prejudice to begin with, I would say. <laughs> I would say there are not three creation myths, there is one creation story of how it actually happened. Uh, Basically, what they're usually referring to when they say this is the Genesis chapter 1 account, and I'll show you. I cover this very thoroughly on my videotape number 7. Let me get the mouse working here. Genesis chapter 1 says God made the plants, the herbs, the grass, etc., on the third day. He made the fowl, the birds, on the fifth day out of the water. And he made man the sixth day after he made the animals. So he made animals first and then man on day 6. That's the order of creation in chapter 1. When you look at chapter 2, it says, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and then it says he put him in the garden and made the trees to grow. And they'll say, see, the order is backwards. This is a different creation myth. This is the basic argument. They will say, in chapter 1, God made the grass plants trees on day 3, whereas in chapter 2, he made the trees after man on day 6. And this little chart kind of shows what their, the whole argument about this question about the creation myths. Here's what really happened. The Lord God made, birds, he made the plants on day 3, then he made the um, birds out of the water on day five. On day six, he made the animals, and then he made man. And then he put man in the Garden of Eden. And then in front of Adam, he made the trees to grow. But it says it was the trees that were good for food. This is not all the trees. The rest of the world is already full of trees. He only made the trees in the garden, and he made one more of each of the animals so that Adam could name them and select a wife. If Adam had not seen God create something, Satan could come along and say, I did all this, and Adam would not know. The only, thing that did not, the only person that did not see anything get created was Eve, and that's the one Satan went to to trick. There's not a contradiction between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a continuation of the story, filling in the details of what happened on day 6. And it's not a creation myth, that's the way it really happened. Thank you. Okay, um, well this one puts me in an awkward position because I'm not here tonight to, to, to denigrate the Bible or to tell you that the Bible is not, not, not correct or that it has contradictions. But I think it does have some contradictions. Um, 
which I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, lots of, of religions look at the Bible and they interpret it. They say, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a set of parables, it's a set of morals, it shouldn't necessarily be taken literally, because if you take it literally, you run into some problems. For example, in Matthew 27, 5, Judas threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and then he went and hanged himself. But in Acts of the Apostles 1, 18, Judas kept the silver and purchased a field with it. He went into it, and falling headlong, he burst open, and all his bowels gushed out. He either didn't keep the silver, or he kept the silver, he either hanged himself, or he didn't hang himself, he died in a field being disemboweled. If you take it literally, then you have to believe both accounts, but obviously both accounts can't be correct unless he hanged himself, fell out of the tree, hit the ground, and burst open. I, you know, um, I guess my, my point here is that um, you shouldn't necessarily take it literally. Uh, you know, I, for example, I don't have a problem with the Ten Commandments. Those are good rules to live by. You shouldn't kill somebody. You shouldn't lie about somebody. You shouldn't steal from somebody. Okay? Uh, you know, do I believe that they should be posted in the public schools? No, because they're not everybody's rules. And some people may have even more rules. Somebody, somebody may have 12 rules for good living, but somebody else doesn't agree with them. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to get into a, a necessarily a debate about the Bible. Uh, pick up your own Bible, whichever copy you prefer, the King James Version, one of the new standard editions, the Catholic Bible, whichever one you're comfortable with and happy with, that's the one you should go by. That's it. Is my, is my microphone? There it goes. Ooh, oh. Technology is our friend. Uh, if evolution is true, why don't we have apes instead of babies? <laughs> we do. Human beings. This gets to the question of whether or not humans are animals. Some creationists will tell you that we're not animals. We are animals. We eat, we sleep, we reproduce. We defecate, we do all those nasty things we don't like to talk about in public, but by golly, every one of us does them. If that doesn't make us animals, what does? Do we have dominion over the animals? Of course we do. We've got all the power. Um, give birth to an ape? Well, you can't do that. I've already talked about, you know, chimpanzees are the closest to us genetically, but there's a little problem with the chromosomes. I personally believe that we shared a common ancestor five million years ago with, with chimpanzees. Not that we evolved from chimpanzees, but then we had a common ancestor. The common ancestor probably had 48 chromosomes. And by the way, I'll, I'll point out something that Mr. Hovind said earlier about, um, um, let me see if I get this. Well, no, I, I think I'll save that for my closing remarks. Um, chimpanzees have, have one extra set of chromosomes. We can't physically reproduce with chimpanzees. Um, oh, one thing I will point out is, uh, if we're talking about kinds here, and we have to talk about relatedness, uh, chimpanzees, I said, were 98.2% similar to humans, but gorillas are about 94%, and orangutans are about 92%. Now, if they're all ape kind, and they all have one common designer, then why aren't they all equally dissimilar? You see what I'm saying? Why, why aren't gorillas 98.2% genetically the same as we are? Why are they a little bit different? Because we understand that they evolved at a slightly different time period. Gorillas, in fact, uh, emerged a little bit earlier. Chimps and humans split about 5 million years ago. Uh, gorillas split off about 10 million years ago. Orangutans about 17 million years ago. The fossil record, by the way, agrees with that. We find the fossils in the correct stratigraphic profile, and the dates match up. We find the first orangutans emerging about 17 to 20 million years ago. The first gorillas show up about 10 to 15 million years ago. The first chimpanzees show up between about 5 and 8 million years ago. The first humans show up about 5 million years ago. Anytime you get two lines of evidence, it's not like I'm telling you that geology has the answer or genetics has the answer, but they correlate with each other. Genetically, we, we see that they're about where they should be in terms of how closely related we are. And the same thing we look at in the, in the fossil record in geology, and we can see that that, that matches up fairly closely. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my response, if evolution is true, why don't we have apes instead of babies? Uh, I would agree there's certainly a genetic difference. Uh, I, I think I would disagree a little when he said, uh, as far as humans are animals, though I've seen some would make me you know, want to believe that. Uh, 
I think it depends on who gets to decide where the classifications are drawn. Uh, if, you don't, if you divide them up, for instance, uh, maybe God's classification system is not the same as Carolus Linnaeus' classification system. It could be that God considers whales, since they live in the water, part of the fish family. Now we've decided to divide them up based on whether they breathe air above water and have milk glands and you know, uh, have hair, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes back to really who gets to decide what the classification divisions are, and then you can change them wherever you want. I would say plants have a body, animals have a body and a consciousness of life, and man has a body and a consciousness of life and a consciousness of God. There's something very different between man and the animals. None of the animal, animals have culture like music and thoughts and express their words and their emotions in, in writing and, and pass down this information generation after generation. Uh, so I'd say we're very different than the animals. Uh, I would not want to do that. Okay, my question, I don't know if it would matter to you, uh, Dr. Hartman. Uh, you may not even want to give a response. You certainly, certainly can if you want. The question is, where did you get your degree from and what is it in? I get asked this question a lot uh, as if usually it's an indication. When someone starts attacking a man personally, which is often what it leads to, these kind of questions, and I'm not saying it is, but often it is, that's an indication they're losing the debate on common sense, logic, and other things, and so they're starting to look for an ad hominem attack on the individual. This is like the you know, Western Union guy comes with a telegram, and you read the telegram, and you don't like what it says, so you shoot the messenger boy. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. So the question, do you have a PhD? Uh, the dictionary definition of PhD is a doctor of philosophy. I went to a small, non-accredited Christian university in Colorado Springs, Patriot University. I earned a Doctor of Philosophy degree. There's their phone number. Call them up if you don't believe me. Uh, they have about 400 students. They have about 25 graduates every year. There were three graduating that year with me with a PhD in education. My degree is in education. It's from a non-accredited school. I don't argue credentials with anybody. If you don't like to call me Dr. Hoven, call me Kent or Hey You or whatever. You, I don't care. But, Deal with the issue, okay? The issue is not whether a person has a degree. I worked very hard for my degree. I don't know if other people work hard for theirs or not. But when a person gets to the point where they're attacking you personally, that's an obvious sign they are losing the debate. So keep that thought in mind. Thank you. Well, let, let me just remind everybody that I didn't ask this question. So, and I don't participate in the ad hominem, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to attack uh, Dr. Hovind at all. Um, where did I get my education and what subject? I have a bachelor's uh, of arts degree from the University of Missouri, uh, granted in 1990, uh, in anthropology, and I have a PhD, a doctor of philosophy, uh, from Texas A&M University, Giga Maggie's, right? Uh, from 1996, also in anthropology. Um, my dissertation was in archaeology, um, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's available, by the way, if you want to look at it through University of Microfilms. I, I didn't bring a copy of my diploma, uh, but you know, I have it hanging on my wall if anyone cares to look at it. That's the answer to that question. Oh, my question. Well, I love this question. How, if we evolved from apes, why do we have a conscious, I guess a consciousness, know what is right and wrong? Some of these, I'm sorry, some of these are in pencil and they're kind of hard to read. How, if we evolve from apes, why do we have a conscious, know what is right and wrong, and apes do not? Uh, I work with apes uh, almost on a daily basis. In fact, I'm on the board of governors for the Little Rock Zoo, and I'm also director of the primate enrichment program. And I didn't know, by the way, I thought this would be a good time to bring this up, that you all were taking up a collection, we're going to split the money with us. I got a little speaking fee last year when I was here, and I donated the money to the primate enrichment fund at the Little Rock Zoo. So if I get any money tonight, that that's where the money's going to go. We use it to buy... Um, what we call enrichment items. See, because apes are very similar to humans in terms of their consciousness, in terms of their behavior, in terms of their intelligence. You know, for example, that chimpanzees have been given human intelligence tests and have scored in the low 60s, which is just below normal for human intelligence. I wonder what they would score if they were given an ape intelligence test and what we would score on that test. See, I think they do know right from wrong. I work with these guys on a regular basis. In fact, um, um, I encourage you all to come to the zoo, and if you get out there about 9 o'clock or 9.30 in the morning, you'll see the results of this enrichment program. I've got a lot of my students that work with me out there. Let me tell you what behavioral enrichment is. Apes are kind of like humans, mentally. In other words, if you just put one in a cage, and a lot of you may remember the Little Rock Zoo when they used to put the primates in the concrete cages with the bars, and they would sit there and throw feces at you or 
bang their head against the bars. Think about what you would do if you were locked in solitary confinement and had people come and stare at you all day and throw things at you and spit at you. You'd go crazy. And that's what the apes do. They go crazy. One of the ways we try to overcome that is providing what we call behavioral enrichment. We give them things to do to occupy their minds because they have minds that need to be occupied. We give them toys to play with. We, give them, uh, we, we don't just throw their food to them like we used to do in the old days at the zoo. We put it in puzzle boxes, things they have to manipulate with their hands, figure out with their brain how to get this puzzle open so I can get the food out. Um, I encourage you all to come to Little Rock Zoo between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, go up to the Great Ape area, and you'll watch uh, the apes come out and get their enrichment items. You'll see them play with it. They use clothing. Uh, they use boxes. You know, they can communicate with us using American Sign Language. I had an interesting debate with a uh, linguistics professor one time who said that apes don't understand language. They do simple mimicry. And I said, well, you know, Washu, the chimpanzee, knows 290 signs in American Sign Language. How many words of chimpanzee do you know? Thank you. All right, let's see. If how, if we evolve from apes, why do we not why do we have a conscious conscious uh, know what is right and wrong and apes do not? I think it is fascinating to study the apes. The apes are very complex creatures, and I'm thrilled for those who take time to study them and, and uh, try to protect them and things like that. I'm certainly not in favor of exterminating any species at all. But I think the fact that the ape is such a complex creature and is able to, to work very well in his environment is proof he, he was designed by a very intelligent designer. Certainly not proof that we have a common ancestor with them. Uh, again, a freshman law student could take that one apart in a few seconds if it was on trial. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not, unfortunately. It needs to be. They keep putting creation on trial. You know, should it be taught in the schools? Well, let's put evolution on trial. <laughs> Where's the evidence for this theory? Okay, so I have no other response other than I agree they're very complex creatures, but I think it's evidence of design. It's not evidence of a common ancestor. Uh, the question, there's two questions on one, Dr. Hartman, if you don't mind. Apparently one of your students, because um, they signed their name, you said they get credit or something. Uh, what is your definition of kind? I would say uh, the same kind of animal are those that were probably originally able to reproduce. In the original created kind, they were able to reproduce, and they may have diversified now because of all sorts of factors, that now they're no longer able to reproduce, but they're probably still recognizable as the same kind as having descended from an animal that was able to reproduce. Second question on the same card, so your student gets two points, I guess. Why can't you believe evolution and creation? Can you prove there's a God? Well, I guess you'd have to go back to what is the definition of evolution. If you mean animals produce a different, a totally different kind, well, there's no evidence for that. If you mean, can animals produce varieties? Well, certainly, I believe that. So you'd have to define the word evolution before I could answer that question. Um, as far as could God use evolution, couldn't God have used evolution to get us here? Well, I, I have several points I'd like to make on that. Uh, number one, that is not the clear teaching of the Bible. I mean, that's pretty obvious. If you want to believe God used evolution, you're certainly welcome to do that. However, that is not what the Bible teaches. Secondly, I'd have to point out, that would be a retarded God who couldn't make it right first time. I would not worship a God like that, that's for sure. My personal unbiased opinion is that people who believe in theistic evolution are trying to find a nice little God that they can put in a box someplace and control him because they don't want him controlling their lifestyle. That's my personal opinion. Thirdly, it's not in the character of my God to use misfits, suffering, and death like evolution calls for. Evolution calls for blind chance, randomness, nobody knows what's going on, let's just toss it out and see what happens. That's not in the character of the God that I worship. Fourthly, it nullifies the need for the death of Christ. If there was already death here in the world, if, if, see, if creation is true, then man brought death into the world, and death is a terrible thing. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world, and death is a wonderful thing because that's how we get ahead. See, if evolution is true, one species has to, or one animal within the species has to evolve a little better than the rest, and the rest of them have to die in order for the good one to take over the, the living space. That's Adolf Hitler's philosophy exactly. Number five, there's no evidence for evolution anyway, so why compromise a perfectly good Bible with a dumb theory like that? I 
was asked earlier to define macroevolution. Macroevolution is simply an accumulation of microevolutionary change over time such that you no longer get two species who are capable of mating naturally and producing fertile offspring. Uh, that's what Dr. Hovind just said happened. You have animals branching out until they're no longer able to reproduce. That's macroevolution, and uh, I'd like the 250,000 in small bills delivered to my office. I mean, that's it, folks. That's, that's our definition of macroevolution. It's the definition that's in all the science textbooks. That's macroevolution in a nutshell. You get enough accumulated microevolutionary changes until you can't have two species mating and producing the same kind of animal anymore. That's it. Uh, in fact, I put the chart up there and I explained it to you. That's what it is. Um, why can't you believe evolution and creationism? I don't see why you can't. I don't think that if you're a theistic evolutionist or whatever term you want to call them, that you're necessarily putting God in a box, um, trying to control God. Uh, I think it's people that are trying to figure out a way that they can merge their faith, their belief, their, their notion of spirituality with what their eyes and their mind tells them, what we observe about the natural order of the world. You know, there, there has to be a way. If I believe, and I'm, I'm using the I rhetorically, if I believe there's a God, but I also understand that evolution is the way things work, then I'm going to try and put the two things together, and I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. Um, can you prove there is a God? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make such an offer, but you, you, you know that offer, the $250,000 offer, you could just as easily twist it around and say, I'll offer anybody in the room $250,000 if they can offer me proof that God exists to my satisfaction, because that's what Mr. Hovind is saying. You have to prove it to my satisfaction in order for me to give you the money. Well, again, I'll ask what his criteria are. Well, proving all five of those literally means you do have to create a new universe, because that's the first step in his uh, list of things that you have to prove. If I could create a new... Uh, uh, um, uh, universe, I would be like a god, and evolution doesn't teach us that we're trying to be gods, we're just trying to be people. Thank you. Okay, my question uh, here was asked, what about the geologic column? Discuss the significance or lack of it to the layers of geologic formation. The geologic column was invented in the 1830s by many people. Charles Lyell's the primary culprit. Uh, each layer was given a different name and age in an index fossil. I taught our science for 15 years. Uh, the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. It only exists one place in the world, and that is in the textbooks. There is no geologic column. They know that, those who study it. This author said, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. There is no geologic column. There are many layers to the earth, that's true, but those all formed during one big flood in the days of Noah. The fact that you can prove this, because in between these layers, there are seldom, if ever, found any erosion marks. Now, don't you think if that layer sat there for 10 million years, waiting for the next one to be laid down, there'd be a little bit of rain? Plus, where did the next layer come from, but from further sediments, which indicates more water moving. So of course there'd be erosion marks. There aren't erosion marks between these layers. Um, the geologic column is a hoax. Uh, it doesn't exist. It's based on circular reasoning. I go through that on my videotape number four for 30 minutes about the geologic column. The layers are not different ages. They cannot be. And it's all based on circular reasoning. I prove all that from lots of quotes on video number four. Let me get to one more point in my last minute. Uh, it's all dated by index fossils. Uh, get up here. Oh, right here. No. Nope. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing straight up. They're running through multiple rock layers. Now, these rock layers are dated at vastly different ages. They'll say this layer is 10 million years older than the one you know, above it, and yet we find petrified trees standing up in the vertical position. Sometimes petrified trees are upside down, running through many rock layers. Those rock layers all had to be laid down in a big flood. The tree didn't stand there for millions of years waiting for the mud to form around it. Mount St. Helens is producing the exact same phenomena right now from the thousands of trees that were blown into Spirit Lake back in 1980. They're being buried standing up. None of them grew there. And it's going to look like a miniature geologic column someday. And it, 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 it happened because of a flood. So the geologic column, it's tragic that this is taught to students in school as if it's some kind of fact when it's absolutely not. Uh, it's a bunch of baloney. We cover that in video number four and also on my website. Thank you. The geologic uh, column 
doesn't necessarily exist in someone's mind. There, there probably is no place on earth where you're going to find a, a 4.5 billion year old layer uh, and every single layer in between. Uh, um, because of the natural processes of the earth, the way we understand the natural processes of the earth, uh, we have two, two basic processes, deposition and erosion. Deposition puts things down and erosion takes things away. To say there's no evidence that, any, that there was any stability, well, I would ask about the Lake Tanyanyika footprints, the hominid footprints that are 3.2 million years old. There was a layer of volcanic sediment deposited. Some early humans, early hominids, walked across the ash layer. And then there was another volcanic eruption that buried the footprints. So that obviously there had to be some point in time when that landscape was stable. People were walking across it. It didn't just all appear in one instance. In fact, where did these footprints come from if all the human beings were, were being wiped out in this single flood instance and the ones that survived were all on the ark, safe and sound? Who were these folks that were walking across leaving these footprints in these layers where there should be nothing in between these layers? Because the layers all were put down at the same time. Um, uh, in terms of finding things like trees in the geologic column, we find all kinds of unusual things in the geologic column. It's because the Earth is not static. It moves around a lot. In fact, um, if you want to understand stratigraphy, which is the science, the study of the, of the layers of the Earth, and you'll learn this in geology class, you have to understand that we talk about uh, layers being deposited, the oldest ones first, kind of like building a layer cake. You put the first layer of cake on, put a little icing on it, put the next layer on top. Which one was there first? The one at the bottom. But we also talk about that in a conformable sequence. That means where there hasn't been any evidence of earthquakes or volcanism or things where things get shifted around, things get mixed up. Um, that's quite common. And you have to be able to read the earth. Um, I have to stop there, but thank you. Oh, I guess I have the next question. This one says, Mr. Hartman, why do you think people should have more than one religion and if you read the Bible, why do you teach evolution? I mean, the answer is clear, black and white. I don't think people should have more than one religion. I think you should have whatever religious beliefs you're comfortable with. Religious beliefs, lack of religious beliefs. I'm not going to dictate to you how you should believe, whether you should believe, whether you should not believe. That's why I don't stand up here and tell you that if you accept evolution, you must reject God. Any more than I will say, if you accept God, you must automatically reject evolution. Um, if you read the Bible, why do you teach evolution? I mean, the answer is clear, black, and white. Boy, not everybody reads the Bible. What do we do with those people? We just tell them they're wrong. They're all going to hell, by the way, uh, even though they may never have seen a Bible. What do we do about all the people that died before the Bible was written, or while it was being written, before they had a chance to read it? Where are they right now? We're just going to automatically, off the cuff, condemn these people. Um, well, I don't think we can do that. I don't think that, um, you know, you should necessarily say, you know, okay, this is my religious belief, and it should be yours because I'm right. And that's the only basis for this, because the Bible is a book of faith, right? You believe it or you don't believe it? If you believe it, well, great, good for you. How many different versions of the Bible are there? Just one? Oh, I don't think so. There are different interpretations. My Catholic Bible, when I was growing up, has extra books in it. The books of the Apocrypha. I'm, I'm sorry. Heresy. Okay. Now I'm going to be heckled. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Talk about ad hominem attacks, right? Thank you. Um, I won't, by the way, return the favor. I, I, I won't do that. Um, you know, there's a billion Catholics in the world. They're all wrong. We're right. We know we're right because we're who we are. I'm divinely inspired. I know I'm right. Somebody else makes the same claim. It's the same thing we're doing up here in this debate. Stand up right now if you walked into this room believing that evolution was the be-all, the end-all, the word and the way, and now you've changed your mind. Or vice versa. I'm a Bible-thumping Christian, by golly, but you know what? I'm going to throw my Bible in the trash can because I don't believe it anymore. Did we change anybody's minds that radically tonight? It's not going to happen. I could be standing up here, an audience of Baptists, an audience of Presbyterians. I've given debates and lectures to Unitarian churches, to Catholic churches, to Lutheran churches. I listened. Uh, during the break, I had a gentleman come up and tell me that, you know, 
uh, basically I was misguided, I was evil, I had these evil followers. You know, I don't, I don't know where that... But he loved me. He said, but I love you. You're, you're evil, you're a bad fellow, you're teaching our children all these bad things, but you know, I love you. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, well, let's see. We've got about 10 subjects open here. I don't know if we're going to be able to close any of them. <laughs> uh, I do appreciate the, the response to, as far as ad hominem attacks, that's certainly not necessary. Uh, and, I, and I agree that uh, should not be included in the debate. The, the material that we're discussing uh, is, needs to stick with science. Quite a few of these questions deals with which version of the Bible and stuff like that. Though I have a very strong opinion on that topic, I don't think that's the purpose of this debate tonight. Uh, we can settle that another night. You mentioned about the footprints. That was interesting uh, to me. St. Louis Zoo put human feet on their Lucy display, and yet not one foot bone was found. One of the professors from Washington University said, this statue is a complete misrepresentation, which is a polite way of saying they lied. The zoo director, Bruce Carr, said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based upon every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. I know what impression they're trying to get across, too. They're trying to impress the kids with the idea that they've got evidence for evolution when they really don't. The footprints you referred to found in the ash, it's interesting how they date that ash, by the way. We've got a long answer to that on videotape number seven, my question and answer. And somebody mentioned during the, they came during the break and, and said, you're just in this for the money. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I don't charge anything for my seminars. I have produced videotapes for 10 years that are not copyrighted. Anybody can get them and copy them and return them and get their money back. Show me any evolutionist that does the same thing, would you please? These footprints found in the ash, uh, they said here are 3.75 million years old, but they're perfectly normal human footprints. They even said in National Geographic, the footprints are described as remarkably similar to those of modern man. The form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. Weight-bearing pressure patterns in the prints resemble human ones. Footprints so very much like our own. And yet on the cover of National Geographic, they put dark-skinned, ape-like creatures. Here's a case where they find zero bones and create a missing link from footprints. Now, if the footprints are exactly like ours, how would you know it's dark-skinned and ape-like? Secondly, why did they put a toe separation if it's exactly like ours? This is propaganda, folks. This is not for education. This is propaganda and ought to be removed from the books. Oh, I think... One more, I need my mic on. There'll be one more question from each uh, gentleman, and then we'll have the closing remarks after that. So one more question each. Can we take and then... like a two-minute break before the closing remarks? Sure, okay. we can. Because I want to get some more water. All right. I got to leave oh. half of my Thanks. Um, I did not get time to call up the slides that I have for this one, but I cover this pretty thoroughly on my uh, video number six about the fossil record and the sorting of the fossils. The question says, please explain the order in the fossil record from simple to complex. If you use your infamous bird bones and clams argument, please keep in mind that there are far more than birds and clams. Okay, um, let me explain what the bird to clam argument is. What has happened in the early 1800s, some people decided evolution is true, and now we must go look for the evidence. So they start with the preconceived idea that evolution happened, and they did nothing but follow Aristotle's old chain of being, that you start with the simple and go to the complex. It, evolution is nothing more than a regurgitation of Aristotle's theory from 2004 or 500 years ago, whatever it was. Um, the sorting of the fossils in the fossil record, first place, there is no clear sorting to the fossils. And even major evolutionists will tell you, look folks, it's silly for the creationists to be arguing about the order of the fossil record because there is no good order to the fossil record. The fact is, I think clams are generally found at the bottom of the geologic column, though not always. I mean, clams are found on top of Mount Everest. But clams are generally found at the bottom because they're already at the bottom. I mean, when a flood comes, they're the first ones going to be buried, obviously. So I think they're buried, birds are buried on top because birds are going to be the last ones to drown in a flood. They fly around till they run out of gas. So they're sorted based upon their habitat. Secondly, they're sorted based upon their intelligence. 
As best anybody can figure out, clams are not too bright. Thirdly, they're sorted based upon their mobility. Clams cannot run very fast. So they're likely to be the first ones buried. And I think if there is any sorting to the geologic column, and there isn't a real good sorting, but any sorting that there is is based on hydrologic sorting that is obviously from a flood. See, some people don't like the idea of a flood because that means God, who created the world, has the authority to judge his creation. And they, don't, they want to keep their God, if they have one, they want to keep him in a box where he has no authority to judge their sin. I'm convinced that's the real hidden agenda behind all this. They don't, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, in the last days, scoffers would come that would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. And that's what we've got. Well, first of all, if there's no order, then there can be no sorting so that the clams wouldn't be at the bottom because they were stupid and the birds at the top because they were smart enough to fly away from it. They would be all mixed up. You wouldn't find the dumb animals at the bottom and the smart animals at the top. You simply would find everything all mixed up. Uh, the rest of the question, which I don't think Mr. Hovan got to, it's, it's difficult to read, admittedly. If you use your infinite bird and bones and clams arguments, please keep in mind that there are far more than birds and clams and explain why the lighter, less dense creatures are near the bottom. Um, well, you know, if the dinosaurs got caught in a flood, and you know, maybe, maybe Noah did take two of each kind of dinosaur, two dinosaur kind, but the rest of them certainly got wiped out in the flood, um, they're heavy. Shouldn't they sink to the bottom? Heavy things sink to the bottom when they drown. Bodies sink to the bottom until they start to decompose and they bloat and they float back up. So why wouldn't you find everything that just sort of settled to the bottom? These things sort of settle out and they get all mixed up when they, when they settle out. Um, Interesting note, uh, the single catastrophic event. You know, we brought up the fact earlier that in the Bible it claims that the earth is flat. You're also talking about a culture, uh, when the Bible was written, or at least parts of it were written, who lived in, in fertile river valleys. And to them, catastrophic events were floods. So it was natural for them to write about floods. It's interesting that you don't find cultures that live in the desert necessarily writing about floods in their creation stories. They write about other kinds of creation. The Australian Aborigines, for example, who live in a desert, they talk about how the ancestors sang the world into creation. It's a really beautiful story. If you're not familiar with it, you should read it. Because I don't just read, you know, the biblical creation stories. I read lots of different creation stories. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of them. You know, you can't agree with every one of them. But, you know, uh, I don't tell somebody else that they can't agree with them either. Um, the stratigraphic column uh, does exist. Uh, we use things like biological correlation. You can go to one stratigraphic layer in one part of the country or the world and find an organism trapped in a particular layer. And you go to another part and you can find another fossil, uh, the same kind of animal, oh, I have to stop now, in the same uh, stratigraphic profile. Uh, take a geology class. Monkeys, where do women evolve from? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Let me bring up uh, uh, Lucy and her kind, her kin, her kith and kin. Um, we talk about we don't have any bones from Lucy's foot, but Lucy's not the only Australopithecus afarensis, to use the, the genus and species, that we found. In fact, we have you know, a number of them, including a, a group of 13 individuals uh, that we found. And we do have foot bones from them. Um, and this is just a, a comparison of a chimpanzee foot, an Australopithecine foot, not necessarily Lucy's foot, okay, but, but one of her species, and a human foot. And to talk about the fact that the, the footprints are, are fake because they're modern human footprints, this is an outline of one of the footprints at Lake Tolly, and it is clearly not a modern human footprint. It is what we would consider a transitional footprint. If an ape footprint, apes have opposable big toes, not unlike our thumbs. They're not exactly the same. Apes have slightly longer fingers and slightly shorter thumbs, but they're opposable. And believe me, you go to the zoo and you can watch chimpanzees can climb the heck out of trees. They got four hands, essentially, right? So they have an opposable big toe. Humans don't. We're bipedal creatures. We walk upright. We have a big toe that's in line with the rest of our toes. The soldiers all line up in perfect order. In fact, I'll tell you all to do an experiment tonight. When you get up and walk around, feel the weight of your body and how it's distributed on your feet. One of the reasons why that big toe is where it is is because it's a major balance point. If you lose your little toe in an accident, get it cut off, you don't have to necessarily learn how to walk all over again. It might be difficult, you know, while it's sore, but if you lose your big toe, and my nephew had a lawnmower accident, he lost his big toe to a lawnmower, 
It took him several months of recuperation and therapy to learn how to walk again because he lost a major balance point. That's what we use it for. Okay? The footprint of the Australopithecines that lived about three million years ago, which is about halfway in between when we think humans first emerged and today, has a foot that is transitional. Here are the bones and here is an outline of the footprint. These are, this is an outline of the Laetoli footprint with the bones superimposed so you can see how it fits together. The big toe is off at an angle. It's not opposable like you would expect to see an ape footprint. It's not straight in line like you would expect to see a modern human footprint. Okay? It is what we call a divergent big toe. It's off at a slight angle. Now, if I'm going to tell you that in evolutionary terms, we transitioned, we went from a quadruped, an ape-like creature that had opposable big toes, to a bipedal human-like creature that doesn't have an opposable big toe, the transition has to be somewhere in the middle. It can't be fully opposable and it can't be in a straight line. It's somewhere in between, and that's, by golly, what we see here. Somewhere in between. And I'll stop there. Would you like me to leave this up? Or? Yes, if you don't mind, that would be great. Um, there are two books we have on our table over here that deal with this subject. One is called Bones of Contention, which goes through the uh, information about the uh, Lucy, the Australopithecines. Um, the one that was labeled Lucy in National Geographic, 1985, was not Lu Lucy's knee, at least, was not Lucy's knee at all. Uh, Donald Johansson let that one slide by. I've got, I think, all of Donald's books at home. Um, Lucy, if the toe is slightly separated, again, I point out, folks, you're finding a bone in the dirt. You don't know that it had any kids. And as far as the way they date those layers, it's really hilarious when you get into it to see how these layers are dated. Um, if we had time, I didn't quite get time to call it up because we're jumping back and forth so many subjects here, but the layers of ash are dated by typically potassium argon dating. We cover that for probably 30 minutes on videotape number seven and also on my website, drdino.com, with some of the wild dates that are obtained by potassium argon dating. Uh, a layer of ash called the KBS tuft had been dated for years at being 212 million years old. They dated it several different ways. Everybody agreed that's 212 million years old until Richard Leakey found a perfectly normal human skull under the KBS tuft. Now they have to go back and redate re the KBS tuft because they know their date wasn't right. Well, the only reason you know it wasn't right is because it didn't match uh, what your, your preconceived idea of evolution. I don't have time. We've got less than a minute. I can't even get my slides up. The, a person that goes barefoot all of their life has a, a foot that's a different shape and wider. The width to length ratio is different than a person that wears shoes all their life. The opposable toe that they put on the uh, footprints in uh, the Laetoli ash over there is not what the footprints showed. I mean, you can read the National Geographic article. It says his form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. So to try to claim that this is a missing link, I think, is silly. First place, all you have are the footprints. And they create these missing links to try to impress the kids that they have some kind of evidence for evolution. There is none. All we have are apes today, and humans today, and chimpanzees today, and there's no intermediates. That just proves the same designer created them all. Um, this subject, I, th I feel, is extremely important. Uh, probably the most important subject in the world is for a person to decide, who are we, why are we here, where did we come from, and what is the purpose of life? There's only two options, creation and evolution. These two options are polar opposites. There is no compromise between the two. Somebody is wrong. And I think it's, worth, uh, it's, it's, it's important that students be shown both sides. I would say, I could, I would, without a fear of successful contradiction, I could say, the schools today, the public schools today, do not show students both sides fairly. The evidence is only given that supports the one religion of evolution. The students are not shown evidence to support creation. For instance, if they notice, they'll, they'll point out to the students that you have two bones in your wrist, the radius and the ulna. The whale has two bones in his flipper. You know, the bat has two bones in his forelimb. And then they will say, see, this indicates a common ancestor. Now hold on just a minute. That indicates a common designer. But that is never mentioned in the textbooks. If you really want to be fair and give the kids an education, then you give them all of the options. 
If you're trying to indoctrinate, of course, then you hide some of the evidence from them or some of the interpretations of the evidence. Um, the Bible's pretty clear that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are without excuse. Nobody's going to stand before God Judgment Day and say, the evidence pointed me toward evolution. No, no, you decided to interpret the evidence that way. You could just as easily have decided to interpret the evidence for a creator if you wanted to. Some people don't like the idea that God created the world because that means there might be some accountability, there might be some rules, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not steal or something like that. And I'm not, sure, I'm not saying that every person who believes in evolution is wicked, but I've met an awful lot of people who like the theory because it justifies their lifestyle. I've met an awful lot of folks like that. Look, if I was going to invent a God, I would not invent one that tells me I can't do certain things that I like to do. The Christian God would be the last one somebody would invent. Because he tells you, thou shalt not do some things, and that's just natural. You want to do some of those things that he says you shouldn't do. The God of the Bible is not the God of our imagination. It's the God of the universe that created everything. And there's going to be no excuse. When we stand before him, he's going to, every knee shall bow, and you will be judged according to God's word. Amen. The Bible says, though, in 2 Thessalonians, that God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. My 30-year study of this has led me to the conclusion that evolution is a lie, and those who believe it are deluded. We see evidence for microevolution, and they are deluded into believing that that is evidence for macroevolution and cosmic evolution and the other ones that I gave. There are six different meanings, folks. One of them is scientific. The other five are purely religious, and they are delusion. If you want to believe them, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. But don't teach that to kids in school. Now, if you want to teach your kids at home, keep your religion at home, okay? Teach them you came from a monkey if you want, or teach them you came from a rock if you want. I don't care what you want to teach your kids at home. But I, I object to them using my tax dollars to spread this stuff in our schools. See, these two theories are polar opposites. If creation is true, there's a creator. <laughs> it's plain and simple. Some people don't like that idea because it chaps their hide. If evolution is true, there is no creator. If creation is true, there are rules. If evolution is true, there are no rules. I challenge you to answer this question. If evolution is true, how do you determine right from wrong? I had a student tell me at Pennsylvania at a public school. I speak in a lot of public schools. I was in five last week. This kid told me in the public school, he sat on the second row. He said, Mr. Hovind, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yes, there is no God. I said, are you sure? He said, oh, I'm sure. I said, well, tell me, son, uh, if you're... Uh, are you sh if you're sure there's no God, how do, you how do you determine right from wrong? He said, oh, that's easy. I decide if something is right or wrong because, he said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, well, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yes, I can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Now, one professor was getting pretty upset in a debate I did one time, and he said, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> uh, think about it, okay? Yes, there are absolutes, thus saith the Lord. And some people don't like that absolute. But see, evolution is a nice way to get by, get by with saying there are no rules. There's no standard for right and wrong. If creation is true, there's a purpose to life. You're made in God's image. But if evolution is true, there really is no purpose to life. You might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Get all the gusto you can get. You only go around once, you know. The humanist philosophies that stem from evolution are frightening. I cover in video number five how that evolution is the foundation for communism and socialism and Marxism. Adolf Hitler was a strong believer in evolution and was simply fulfilling what the theory teaches. The strongest should survive, the weaker should be eliminated for the good of the species. He was acting out what evolution really teaches. If creation is true, then man's a fallen creature. He needs a savior. But if evolution is true, you don't need a savior. Save from what? There's no such thing as sin. That's why the devil gets people to believe this theory, so they won't come to the Savior. He hates you. He wants you to go to hell. God loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. If creation is true, then man brought death into the world. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. Death is the hero of the plot for evolution. They don't talk about it much, but that's the way it has to work. 
One animal has to evolve characteristics that are a little bit better, and the rest of them have to die, folks. Death is how we get ahead. Charles Darwin said so in his book. Thus from the war of famine and death, and I forget the exact quote, but I've got it here. He said, the most uh, advanced species, were, are the most important thing we're capable of conceiving, the advancement of higher animals directly follows. Some words to that effect. Charles Darwin was convinced that death and suffering and war and famine was a wonderful thing because that's how we get ahead. I quote that in detail in my video number four. If creation is true, there's an afterlife. God not only made you, He made you for a purpose. Now, if you don't want to do what He says, that's your business. But you'll stand before Him one day, and so will I. If evolution is true, there absolutely is no afterlife. You just get recycled into a worm or a plant. If creation is true, you can actually know the future. Not with evolution. No hope. If you think I leave my gorgeous wife, because I like to come up here and look at you better, you're mistaken. My wife broke her tailbone nine weeks ago and is sitting at home right now in excruciating pain and it hurts me deeply to have to leave. She's, she's, she's fine, I can't do anything much for her except you know sit there and talk to her and comfort her, but um, I came because I want students to see there's evidence for the other side and there is no evidence that we've seen any animal produce any different kind of animal. And it's unfortunate that kids in the universities are not shown the evidence for creation. Why are they lied to? Why are they shown that kids are why are they told that the baby has gill slits? Go check your biology textbooks, folks, right now. It's in your textbooks right here. Proven wrong in 1874. Why would somebody leave that in the textbooks? One professor I debated, I gave about 30 different things that are not true in the textbooks, and he said, folks, Mr. Hoban's right. These things are not true. But, Mr. Hoban, I've got a question for you. What would you replace them with? I said, folks, what he's trying to not say is, Hey, we want the kids to believe in evolution. We have to give them some evidence. He's taken away our evidence, so he's got to find a replacement. I said, sir, I'm sorry. If you don't have any evidence for your theory, I'm sorry. Maybe you should find a new theory. But it's not, the burden of proof's not on me to replace evidence. I think we just simply ought to get the textbooks, which contain lots of good science, and cut out the bad science. And I go through that on video number four of all the pages that need to be removed from your textbooks, and the books will be fine. You don't need to buy a whole new book. I'm not trying to get creation into the schools. I'm not trying to get the Bible into the schools. I want the schools to teach science. And evolution is not part of science. Microevolution is really a bad name. We ought to just call it a variation. That's all it really is. See, the devil's a liar. He's deceived people. The Bible says he's a liar. I think he's using this evolution theory to lead folks to hell. Now, you don't go to hell because you believe in evolution. You go to hell because you haven't accepted Jesus Christ. And I don't want anybody to go to hell. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? You're going to be dead for a long time, you know. The Bible says God cannot lie. He said He'd save you if you'd ask Him. Thirty-one years ago, I asked Him. Every one of us is going to die. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. <laughs> And it's going to happen to you too, and you better be prepared for that because you're going to be dead for a long time. I know one thing. Even if all else is taken away, my position is certainly a lot safer. If I'm wrong, I haven't lost a thing. I've had a wonderful life. What if the evolutionist is wrong? It's going to be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Thank you so much. Purpose to life. Well, let me start with that. Purpose to life. Uh, Dr. Hovind started out earlier this evening talking about humans having a basic desire to understand things. Uh, where, we, where, where we came from, how we came to be, um, why we are where we are. We all have a curious nature, don't we? I mean, human beings are curious if nothing else. I mean, if we weren't, we wouldn't be doing half the things that we're doing. What purpose to life does evolution offer us? 
Well, it offers us a chance to learn where we came from, how we came to be, what we're doing here. No morals. Evolution doesn't really discuss morals or not. That's a question for society. What would happen if Dr. Hovind decided that I'm going to murder you in five minutes? Would all of you just stand here and let him do it because that's his personal belief and he believes that that's right? Society doesn't allow that. Society sets rules. There are lots of societies that aren't based on the Christian faith that have lots of moral rules. People understand right from wrong with whether it's dictated to them in a religious doctrine or not. We have to have rules if we're going to live in a society. Don't we? See, if you look at, you know, I also teach about different cultures in the anthropology department. If you look at a, a hunting and gathering society, a small group of people, 25 people, living together in a certain area, and they sort of wander around the landscape, hunting and gathering for a living. You know, they don't have a whole lot of rules, because there's only 25 of them. 25 people, they all know each other. They all know if you screw up. They know if you took it into your own mind to murder somebody else, you know? They're not gonna let you get away with it. But what happens when society starts to grow? There are more and more and more of us. How many people do you think are in this room right now? 100, 200 people? Could we all get along the same way? We have to set down some kind of rules. How many people in here have ever broken a law in your life? Raise your hand if you've ever, speed limit. That's a law? That's wrong, folks. But you know, you didn't get caught. Or maybe you did get caught and you had to pay a little fine. How many people have ever murdered somebody in here? Raise your hand if you've committed murder. Well, nobody's going to raise their hand because the rest of us are going to turn around and go, they did it. It's because we as a society decide what rules we're going to live by, what rules we're going to have to obey. And you know, there are sort of minor rules and major rules. You have to understand how society functions, how culture functions. Culture didn't just appear overnight either. It's evolved. Lots of the great state level societies the Western world is included in this, have rules that are based on religious doctrines. The Egyptians had rules. The Aztecs had rules. Some of them were pretty nice rules and some of them were pretty evil rules or bad rules. It depends on your, your way of looking at things. We don't necessarily excuse them. All Westernized societies that are based on Christianity aren't always good. Now the Muslims will attest to that during the 12th and 13th centuries when the Crusades were happening. A group of religious people got together and decided to go out and convert or kill people if they didn't want to be converted. Well, Dr. Hovind was also spending a great deal of time saying that we want evidence. Show me the evidence. Like, show me the money. Show me the beef. Where's the beef? Give me the evidence. He's holding us up to a standard that he doesn't want to participate in. Here's my offer. Here's my proof. It's in this Bible. Believe it or don't believe it. If you don't believe it, why are you going to be in trouble? Maybe, maybe not. There are an awful lot of people, evolutionists aside, take the evolutionists out of the equation. There are lots of other people who are devoutly religious, hold very deep religious beliefs who would argue that point, just as vehemently as he would argue his point. But see, most of the people in this room agree with him, so he's right. The other people are wrong. We know they're wrong. They lose. Boy, don't you wonder why there's so much strife in the world? Why we all can't get along? Why can't we? Why don't we all agree? If this is the, 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 the truth, you know, there's an awful lot of people being deceived. Maybe they are. I'm not telling you they are or they aren't. That's not what I'm here to do. That's for you to decide for yourself. A personal decision. I don't think it's fair to hold somebody up to a level of proof that you're not willing to hold yourself up to. What benefits do we get from uh, evolution? I think he mentioned that there weren't any. Uh, how many of you here have been vaccinated for any number of diseases? Anything. Measles, smallpox, polio, all of that came out of evolutionary studies. We studied viruses, we studied bacteria, we studied parasitology. We look at parasites, things that make us sick. 
And we come up with ways to combat them that are a direct result of evolutionary study. We understand how these things came to be, how they live. Viruses are weird little creatures. We're not really sure if they're alive or not. They're sections of DNA, they're fragments of DNA that invade your cells, right? like the flu virus, and it does weird things to your cells, and we have to figure out a way to combat it. How many of you had a flu shot this year? I had one. I have to get one at work at the zoo. Anybody get the flu regardless of having the flu shot? Because there are different strains of flu out there. And they're evolving. They're constantly new ones. They're becoming resistant to our antibiotics. If you go to the doctor and they put you on antibiotics, the next time you go, they can't put you on the same ones because the virus that you may have may be resistant to that. That's evolution. I brought a couple of books with me tonight. I just grabbed this one off my shelf. Uh, it's called Understanding Human Evolution, fourth edition by Frank Porter and Jeffrey McKee. And I bought a copy of the Bible. This is a 1901, this was printed. Let's see if I can tell you which version it is real quick. The Holy Bible contained the Old and New Testaments translated out of the original tongues, being the version set forth A.D. 1611, compiled with the most ancient authorities and revised A.D. 1881 to 1885. It's the 1901 Standard Edition. There's a, there's a difference between these two books. This is a science book, and this is a religious book. You're not going to find any science in here. Uh, you're probably not going to find a lot of religion in here. Okay? There's a difference. This is a science book. It was meant to be revised. Because science is constantly changing. We're constantly finding new things. Dr. Hovind keeps pointing out all the things that Charles Darwin said. Most evolutionists would say, well, Charles Darwin had, had a lot of, he set forth a lot of our basic understanding of evolution, but we don't, we don't simply hold up Darwin and say, he was right. It's all natural selection. It's everything he said is correct. We've revised his theories. This is the fourth edition of this book. Every two or three years, we revise what's in the book because we learn new things. We're constantly learning new things. We know more now than we knew 140 years ago when Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species. He didn't know about Gregor Mendel's work with the pea plants from the 19th century. That wasn't rediscovered until the early 1900s. He didn't understand DNA. If he had, he probably would have written a little bit different version of his theory, the same way we're doing today. We revise the science books. We're not trying to deceive anybody. If you pick up a book from the 1960s, there will undoubtedly be errors in it because we've learned new things. A hundred years ago, we didn't understand that bacteria could cause diseases. 150 years ago. Now we do. Should we not put that in the science book? Should we not revise the theory? We have to. This book was not designed to be revised. Right? We can't use this uh, simply to explain all of nature. God gave us a curious nature, and then he said, all the answers you need are here. Why do we have a curious nature? Why do humans seek to understand where we come from. I like, uh, I know a lot of you are anti-Catholics. I got that from the heckling I got earlier. But I thought I would read part of the papal bull put out by Paul II. It has nothing to do with Catholicism. He simply said that uh, the Bible does not attempt to teach us how heaven was made. It's simply there to tell us how to get there. Other books need to address how the heavens were made how we came to be, where we came from. Evolutionary theory is a scientific theory. It's not a belief system. I don't care if you believe in it or not. It doesn't alter the, 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 the basic concepts as we understand them. Microevolution is there. We understand microevolution to be accumulated into macroevolutionary changes, which causes one species not to be able to breed with another species. Dr. Hovind's already admitted that that is true. He said there certainly are creatures like that. There have to be. If that's true, then you have to accept evolution. Now, whether or not you choose to accept uh, uh, the Bible as well, that's your business. I have to stop now. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you inviting me. First of all, um, I say thank you both of you guys for 
Come and give both of them a round of applause, would you? The, uh, the primary reason for Heritage Baptist Temple holding this debate is not to get you just to believe in creation, but it's that you'll be saved. And you know what? If you're not saved, not only will you not make heaven, but you're missing a great life that God has for you. Our desire is not that we're putting our thumb on you and making you feel ignorant and making you feel strange, but our desire is, hey, we know what it means to be saved, and what a blessing it is. Why don't you just look to the truth? You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Listen, God loves you. In Jeremiah 31, he says he draws you with an everlasting love.